We're going to turn now to a different financial function, which is the payments landscape. And I'm very excited to be here with the panelists and to talk about technological transformation in payments. And I would like to just briefly introduce, introduce them. So we have here uh, Gally Heichel um, from Klarna, and uh, she's in charge of globally all payments partnerships. We also have Ali Heron, who's an advisory board member and the former CTO of Pedal. And we have Larry Diamond, the, the CEO and co-founder of Zip. So I think this group is, is very well equipped to discuss what's happening in technological changes in payments. And I was wondering if we could just start with, you know, the most exciting things that you see AI capable of doing. And maybe we could start with sort of the user experience aspect of that. And then we'll turn to, you know, the guts of how things work, which is also pretty interesting. So, um, you know, Gally, maybe you want to just start with, with uh, talking about that. Sure, and thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you for having me. Um, so the most straightforward application, I think, of AI for people who are deep in the industry like us is that it will allow um, more efficient uh, processing and routing on transactions and basically better approval rates. But that's not nearly as interesting as what it would allow kind of around the transaction, right? Because after all, none of us wake up in the morning and say, hmm, how do I feel like paying today, right? It's a critical activity, but it's actually the most successful when it's seamless and less noticeable and goes as smooth and, and allows people to actually not think about it and have peace of mind. And that's where AI will become critical in facilitating better, more personalized customer experience. Uh, it will allow you to find what you're looking for with greater ease and to pay with it with greater peace of mind. And basically for, for us behind the scenes facilitating all of that, it just translates to allowing with your permission to utilize your data to know you better, to make better underwriting decisions to have more efficiency in the way we run our operations and that translates to giving back more value to our consumers, right? And then also um, increasing your purchase power by making better underwriting decisions than we were able just based on, you know, big data, which, which was the big buzzwords um, just a few years ago. Yeah, so big data being the raw material for everything that's happening, happening now. Maybe, Larry, do you want to grab that one as well and just... Tell us what you think. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy Friday, everyone. So I think, um, you know, G Gally touches on a good point, which is um, because your question is really around the, the user experience. And, and I think, you know, ultimately in, in the payments game, it's all about how do you make transactions seamless, frictionless, effortless, right? It's kind of the, uh, the sort of Uber experience as, as payments and fintech becomes invisible. But at the same time, how do we block, um, you know, first party fraud, third party fraud and and bad credit. So I think it's going to have a huge, a huge impact in, um, you know, blocking a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, the, the false positives, um, identifying what is sort of normal behavior um, across, across the, uh, the different experiences. And, um, and so ultimately, you know, I, I think for, for us, the personalization is also a pretty massive one. I think that, and, and obviously we're still trying to understand the new large language model side of AI and how that's working that's going to, um, you know, disrupt the the uh, the general payments industry. But I think there are sort of new interfaces now that actually allow you to have a much more personalized experience, um, which is trying to take you back to that mum and pup store when you went in and 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 you know the the the, the retailer knew, knew your name, they knew you, you'd been in here a couple of days ago and maybe bought the milk and and address and so forth. And I think that interface will allow personalization to sort of move to the next level, particularly for um, apps apps like Zip, like Klarna and, and financial services. So I think that's that's going to be big. Um, and uh, and obviously chatting. I think chatting is going to become, is going to, and we'll talk about that obviously shortly, uh, but, you know, the, the, we have 200 agents in the Philippines, right? And I just think there's just so much value going to come into the customer experience. One of our values, as you can see on the screen, is sort of customer first. So how do we really leverage that in 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 every touch point um, across all of our interfaces? Signing up, talking to agents, and and so forth. So pretty exciting time. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, this this is a fantastic conversation to have at this time. Ali, how about you? What do you see happening? 
Yeah, I mean, I want to actually uh, touch on something Francis Haugen said earlier, which is like, as technologists, we need to remember we exist in a, in a you know, a bigger society. And, you know, as Gali was saying, and as Larry was saying, you know, you know, payments is hard, like, and we understand how it all works. Like, there is very little financial education, especially in the U.S. school systems. And so, like, how can we make this seamless? How can we develop tools that leverage AI, especially some of these new conversational models, as Larry was saying, to help people make smarter decisions? You know, frankly, how we leverage this technology and how we decide to decide who gets access to things like credit, that's something very, we're very passionate about at Pedal. You know, there are 150 million Americans today who don't have access to mainstream credit because they have thin credit files, no credit files, especially immigrants, or they have a thick file system and then they frankly didn't understand what they were doing and messed up their credit score. Like we and how we develop these experiences will frankly help decide who are the you know new haves and have nots financially. This is no, this is a key point, and I think you've you've made a great uh, a great stride in, in just talking about financial inclusion with uh, your various businesses and stuff. I'm wondering if 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 are, are any of you guys integrating with Chat GPT yet, and if so, um, if you can share how that's working, like give us some user journeys or use cases there for how that might look. Um, so we have made a public announcement that we are collaborating. Um, we're using it uh, both externally and customer facing experiences, like have basically ha leveraging ChatGPT to be your own personal assistant. And I think, you know, FinTech's promise is to know you as a consumer better and help you uh, achieve what you're trying to achieve with more ease and efficiency. Um, I think we've all been successful in sort of narrow use cases to date, but chat GPT really takes all of that into the next level um, and allows us to assist you much more. Um, also internally within the company, we are encouraged to do as much as possible with chat GPT all the way from, you know, creating periods and decks to having it run through our, you know, models as a validation. Again, I don't think it will ever replace uh, a human being, but as another input or point of view that then can be taken into account in the decision-making process, um, we have started to incorporate it. Um, I will bring up the most probably straightforward concern. I think the intellectual property aspects of um, AI models um, is far from being sorted out. So I think it's it's something that every company kind of needs to decide itself to, to itself um, whether it's worth the trade-off. You are taking some risk here, but is the reward kind of much greater and that weighs the potential downsides from it. Um, and I'd say, yeah, in, just in general, there is encouragement across the board to explore more use cases. There are actually work streams now to just across every one of the critical functions from risk and compliance to ops, to finance and analytics, to customer service, um, kind of come up with new use cases for ChatGPT to help us become more efficient. The more efficient we are, the more draw value we can drive bas basically back to our consumers and merchants. Thanks. Fascinating because I think every organization is is actually having similar conversations. So it's it's really interesting to hear how this shapes up in you know in your world of payments. Um, Ali, how about how about you guys? I mean, obviously can't can't comment always on you know non-public future plans. Absolutely. But, you know, I, I mean I do think it's really important though to think about just like when you look at AI models and like interoperability of, of AI and machine learning and how do you actually understand what decisions are being made. I think you similarly have to think about you know, what are the guardrails and what is kind of the oversight on chat GPT when you're really integrating it into these customer experiences? You know, a, a friend of mine gave me the, the best analogy. It's like chat GPT is like a C plus student in every single, you know, topic known to man, mankind, right? Womankind. And it's like, okay, cool. As a C student, that's lovely. But if a C student gives you really bad advice or a really bad answer, and you're integrating this into your, you know, experiences, like how do you make sure it doesn't harm customers in some way or doesn't lead folks down a, down a path that may not be in their best interest? You know, I love that Larry has his uh, their company values. You know, for customer first, it's like you know, you really need to make sure you're not, you know, doing 
you know, the computers are telling you to do something when it actually, you know, it's not actually what you should do. And I, you know, poor customers don't necessarily know any better. No, I think I, I, I'm going to use that line with my students. I got to say, Alan. <laughs> I, I got it from a friend. I can't take credit. <laughs> uh, what about you guys, Larry? Are you guys thinking about integrating with ChatGPT? Of course. I mean, uh, every you know, it, it's it's the hot buzzword. You know, the AI has been around for more than ten years. It's actually Zip's tenth birthday today. And I remember when we started Zip ten years ago, and we were trying to disrupt the world of consumer finance by leveraging alternative data to make better decisions. So not just um, credit bureau data, but bank transactional data, um, shopping cart data, et cetera, et cetera. We used a a rules-based engine, you know, based on my partner's 10 years of consumer finance experience and a lot of intuition. Even the rules we set around the bank data were quite simple. Are there any payday loans? You know, what's the average balance throughout the period, the drawdown, what happens after they get paid, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I've watched us move over the last 10 years from from, from rules to artificial intelligence, machine learning models. And, and now, you know, in, in the US, 100% of all decisions are, are automated. We've got ML models, champion challenger. And so I think what we're seeing now is the next huge leap um, trained by, by um, language models. And there are some obvious places that we are using in the business just to get more efficient in just general tasks and research. One of the team in strategy, you know, took your questions and put them in chat GPT. And if we all use that, we'd probably be talking about the same thing. Um, so. Uh, and then obviously in chat land, we have 200 agents and we're trying to monitor things like CSAT scores and how do we deliver the best customer experience and quality. So I do think the governance that Ali and, and Gally were talking about is really important because you've got to make sure it's fit for purpose. And so I do think there's this efficiency step before you deploy it into the front end, which is agents can at least act, you know, if we, one is we have to upload the data and do it in a very secure way and we're still working out how to do that but it's going to have a lot of proprietary information, PII and so forth. But then ultimately, I think it can make agents much more efficient in sort of how they respond. So before we deploy it straight into production, it can sort of be there as a, as a, as a coach and um, mentor. But, you know, our, our engineers and others are, are starting to uh, play with it. Uh, and yeah, I think it's going to be, we sort of have to go on a journey here. A, a lot of the work we've been doing is models deployed at customer sign up, models deployed at transaction, models deployed at customer login which tends to be behind the scenes, doesn't have that interface with the customer. And uh, so we're going to work out how to, how to bring that to life. You guys all mentioned uh, some form of, of financial education and education is obviously kind of in the crosshairs for a lot of this stuff, but also a huge opportunity. So I think the, the Duolingo uh, founder has, has been a big proponent of this and has, has been talking about the use of, of AI. So for your customer set and for payments in general, what is the thing you most want people to learn that are users of your services? Ellie, I, mean, I can jump in and okay, say that, um, you know, coming into, I wasn't born and raised here and coming into this country as an adult and after at least my undergraduate uh, education, I was still shocked at the amount of finance that the average person on the street here needs to understand in order to keep themselves out of trouble. Um, So I would say the most basic understanding that people need here is how do credit bureaus operate and what, you know, everyday actions that they decide to take or not take um, can impact um, their credit file and their credit score. Um, I remember as a NYU student, I was about to graduate and finally get my own place and I needed to buy some furniture. I wanted uh, it to be a step up from your general, you know, IKEA furniture, and I needed a loan in order to do that, not on huge amounts, but, you know, for me as a more, you know, a new person into this country, I just walked to my seat, you know, my bank branch and asked, can I get a personal loan? And of course, I, within 10 minutes, got declined for that loan because I had a very thin file. I was, had a year of experience in that, con- in this country. So, um, you know, now that I'm more educated about it, I will definitely not go the route again of just walking into a branch and asking for a personal loan. But I think that um, basic education from as young as, um, as middle school needs to take place so that even kids understand um, how to use um, tools that are available or even, you know, debit cards nowadays are even available for kids. 
um, you could use these in a smart way to build uh, a strong credit file. Um, and you also have to be aware of like, you know, things that you would do without paying attention to it could actually hurt your um, profile. Yeah, I'll add, I think, I think, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, yeah, say, I think, I think there, there, there are a couple of kind of just basics. I think folks need to understand interest. How does it work? How does it compound? How does it work in your bank account? How does it work in your, you know, a credit card? Um, you know, I think right now, especially, and I see this with my, my kids, you know, you just tap your phone, right? Like magically stuff gets paid for. Right. And when it seems like magic, you know, before you had to like, you know, I'm old, right. You know, you bills and it was like physical and you had to like carry, you know, make sure you had your money, but now it just, it's all just kind of there. And so I think understanding the, 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 the physical, the like, like value of, of money and what, what does that mean and, and how do you earn and save and how, what, what does it mean to, um, just some of these, I mean, even taxes. I mean, we just had tax day like earlier this week, right? Like, how many master's degrees or PhDs do you need to understand how the hell taxes work um, and how you're getting taxed and why and where it comes out and know your income isn't actually your income. You gotta, you know, there's just a lot of basics there about like how the ecosystem works, especially in the US. And obviously it's very country specific to really understand like how can you be a responsible financial system and not, you know, put yourself in harm's way. I like Ali's point around uh as fintech gets easier and more effortless, we have much more of a responsibility um, to put control back in the hands of our user. And I use the same example. When my kids see me tapping, um, and it is quite funny, when I moved across to, Australia, to America last year, in Australia, all I have is my mobile phone. Everything's on here. I, my digital driver's license, uh, log into the office, cards. America's still a little bit like the third world of payments in, in some respect. Uh, you know, so it's got sort of that, that, that whole continuum. But, you know, this idea of I had $5 in my pocket and I no longer have the $5, this sense of scarcity means we do have to teach our children a, a new way of, of understanding this. When I had $5 to go to the canteen, the tuck shop, you know. Um, so I think that is, that's, that's incumbent on all fintech providers. Um, I think the other interesting piece is the bureaus, right? Uh, the bureaus themselves work on, obviously, they're, they're well-placed for the future of uh, customer credit. However, they use a lot of old traditional ways of, of building scores and correlation, less predictive. And when we started out the business, we went, you know what, bank data is gonna be pretty interesting. So we worked out how to uh, extract bank data in sort of microservices, cleanse it, categorize it, and then start to put the rules over it. But actually the bank data is probably the most powerful. And so, you know, I think that's going to get really interesting to help, you know, financial literacy and financial inclusion. That's what we, all three of us are, are sort of working on. Our big focus is, you know, how do you create a world where people are fearlessly today knowing they're in control of tomorrow? So, so when they click our button, um, customers know that, uh, that, that we have their back. And I think a lot of that data is, is going to be very powerful uh, in, for, the, for the next frontier. And the other, the final example is sort of PFM, personal financial management, you know, the apps like mint.com, they've always lived in sort of PFM 1.0. We haven't really seen 2.0 come about, which is really to provide the insight, the nudges, what should I do next? Not just is there a better product than lead gen, but actually budgeting and saving and what do I pay back first? So I, I think that's going to be very exciting for consumers over the next five, five years or so. Larry, Can I add one point on Larry's? Sure. And I just want to make, I want to put a fine point on this. The data is the important part. Like we get so excited about these models and what they can generate, but garbage in, garbage out. And so like, I think everyone here like needs to remember, like don't just be wowed by the models and don't just be wowed by the outputs. You need to understand the inputs, how the thing was trained, what biases are in there. Because without that, you know, just conceptual understanding, you don't necessarily need to understand what the model actually does. There's a lot of very fascinating, but very complex math behind it. But you need to understand what went into it so you can understand how to trust and make sure it makes sense and you're you know, doing right by, by the customer in terms of what comes out. No, that's, no, that's a great point. Thanks for making it. I want to just pick up on something Larry alluded to about his, his move from the beaches of Australia to the beaches of New York. and. One of, the, one of the topics in payments is just the uneven progress around banking systems, instant banking, open banking around the world. 
And this is kind of the guts part of, of payments. And I'm wondering if you all could just describe for our audience kind of the major trends you see here, there, what's holding you back, what's advancing really quickly, you know, what are you excited about? If you could just highlight some of the key things about tech transformation, just in the infrastructure part. I'm happy to go first. Okay, go for uh, it. So I think, yeah, so open banking is going to be huge, is is huge. Uh, you know, there's been screen scraping. It's now moving to APIs and, and done in a very secure way. Uh, and that's obviously lending itself to potentially disrupting the debit schemes as well because you ultimately can now pay by account, pay direct from your bank account. And so I think that's going to get um, really interesting, particularly for the next wave. The Gen Zennials are probably going to adopt it uh, first, um, which is typically how these technologies work. And I think that's going to mean lower cost processing. It's going to mean rich data uh, for, for the purposes of, 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 of customer um, engagement. So I think sort of number one that's we're, that we're really in, interested about. I think real-time payments is also super exciting because ultimately a huge part of this economy is driven by the small business. And I, and, and I think if you can increase the velocity of payments and payouts, to small businesses, it means that if they get paid at 11 o'clock today, they can get that money, they can then put that back into the economy. So I think that's going to be really interesting for the the, the small business community. Uh, and that's pretty much on trend and moving and moving there pretty pretty uh, quick, quickly. Uh, and then I think just mobile payments, I was reading a stat that one in three people in the world use uh, super apps, right? And, and we're seeing the WeChats, the alleys. In, in, in America, you know, Square's obviously getting there as well. And so I, I think just as the data starts to pull together, that the metadata associated with that's going to mean uh, much more engaged customer conversation. So th th those are probably the themes on on uh, my side. So the, um, the UK has had uh, open banking and APIs for about five years, and I think there's been sort of mixed reviews of that, but still a lot of op uh, opportunities, as you describe, and this is a whole new world, Larry. What about um, Ali and 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 uh, Gali? What do you guys think? I agree with Larry 100%. I mean, we've seen it. Uh, Klarna is based in Northern Europe and Central Europe, or and these systems are much more abundant and used for everyday transactions. Um, I think one of the reasons that the U.S. Be is behind is because uh, credit and debit cards have been here so established and so successful with no competition for so many years. Uh, that people just assume that it works well, why replace it? Um, and it does, I mean, you know, cards provide, for example, purchase protection. And um, I think there is some misconception that if you don't pay with a card, you can't get that protection. And I think what all of us are trying to do uh, in our day-to-day is to say that there are other ways in which consumers can get those same protections and it doesn't need to involve a plastic, which makes the process more expensive for all of us and for the merchants mainly and kind of stands in the way of a merchant being able to put money back into economy and to give more value back to the consumer. Um, so I absolutely echo everything that Larry says here. I think the other thing is, you know, this is probably the most capitalist economy in the world. So it's very driven by private markets. And as such, um, you know, different, uh, you know, alternative payment networks uh, were spun up here now between RTP and FedNow. And, um, you know, I think uh, over the next two years, we will kind of see um, consolidation or who has the, uh, the leg up here, because eventually I, I feel like ubiquities it's critical for any payment system to be successful. So either um, these systems find a way to be truly interoperable or just one of them will gain the critical mass and become the fact of the way that most people transact. Yeah, I wanna actually, uh, you know, de definitely agree with Larry and I wanna, you know, kind of hone in on one of, one of Gali's points, which is, you know, the kind of ubiquity. Like the, there, there's kind of two layers in my mind. There's the network layer, that everything has to transit over, right? And the internet worked great and works great because that's all interconnected now. There are standards, there are sta like the IETF is the you know, internet 
oh, uh, well, now I have to remember what the IETF stands for. But like, you know, it's a, you know, it's an organization, nonprofit that like helps make sure like there are standards in the internet, right? The early days of the internet that I remember in like the 80s, I'm totally dating myself. It's like, you know, there's the AOL network and this network and this network. But like the magic is the fact that you have a complete interconnected network. Then on top of that is the data. And Larry talked about the data in terms of open banking. There's currently uh, CFPB is doing rulemaking on 1033. And that's basically making sure not only consumers are in control of their data, but that financial institutions have to be at make, you know, make it accessible. Now, if every single, and there are a zillion financial institutions in the, in the US, you know, I'm sure others here know the exact number, like if they all make it accessible in different ways and the APIs are different and this, that, and the other thing, it's gonna be a complete mess. And consumers, frankly, won't be in any control because it's, you know, it'll be just like virtually I have to go to all these financial institutions versus physically I used to have to go and say, hey, can I have a copy of my financial history or, you know, and you, you know, put together these packets to go apply for a mortgage or to rent a house, you know, rent an apartment, whatever. And so in my mind, there's that the two parts that both need to need, um, you know, standards and ubiquity in order for, you know, for the, the, the system to work as I think we all envision it working in the future. So you guys all, oh, go, go ahead, Larry, did you, was there something? You no, wanted? I was just going to say the, um, the, the point earlier about Visa, Visa and MasterCard, and we, and we all work with them, right? So the, uh, we thank them for their infrastructure, incredibly helpful. However, you know, the, the earlier conversation was around blockchain. Right, and and I've always I've always been sort of waiting for this group of people to sort of arise and build the next Visa Mastercard on a distributed ledger where it's you know secure, transparent, decentralized, uh, where the merchants could actually own the network. The cost of processing is sort of incredibly low, and uh, so I think it's going to be interesting to see how the blockchain payment networks evolve over the next five years because that can add incredible value to the entire ecosystem. I'm glad you picked up on that point since our previous uh, panel discussion was all about the latest in, in Ethereum. So super, super for making that connection. I was wondering, so all of you guys have an interesting connection to NYU. So uh, Ali and Gally, you've spent time here as executive residences. Uh, Larry, you're working with us here as well. And I wonder if, if as you think about this audience of faculty and students and, and alums, if you want to tell a little bit about your, your personal stories and payments and relate that just to some, some advice and counsel for those here who might be interested in either exploring research topics and payments or careers and payments, um, I'm wondering if you, if you have ideas to share about what you think the most interesting directions of travel for some of those things are for our audience. Whoever wants to go first. Gal, you want to go Yes. Sure. Um, so my experiences with NYU has been that um, there's like a vast amount of hands-on practical experience and knowledge here, uh, which is really cuts across all groups of constituents on, you know, on, on campus. It's not just the professors or the clinical professors. It's also the students and where they come from. Um, and I'd say it's just such a powerful tool um, for me when I landed first at Klarna close to four years ago. And it seemed like even though I came from Google, which was a tech, you know, I could argue fast paced tech company, a fintech, uh, especially trying to make it in the U.S. is a whole different, uh, you know, pace it's like uh and there was uh an nyo alum uh from stern who who basically kind of showed me the ropes uh who, who was a veteran at nyo i think he's even here today that kind of showed me the ropes and uh kind of helped me uh be successful in this uh environment that is very fast uh, moving and and seems just slightly less um, structured and organized than Google or Citibank, where which is where I spent my career before. Um, I'd say I'd, my best advice is engage with the community as much as you can, and uh, do not wait until you actually need something, but do, make a point to do it on some kind of a regular basis at whatever cadence you can afford to do so. I mean, every time that I come, whether I come for, to give a lunch and learn, I, I end up speaking to people that then teach me something I didn't know, help me make a connection at a company that I'm working with that I didn't have previously. 
Um, it's just, I can't speak enough about how powerful it is. And I think payments, it's one of those industries that may seem vast, but it's also small at the same time. So the more you get out there, the more you talk to people, I think the more efficient and kind of the more you'll be able to make advancements to your own agenda without even trying hard, it will kind of come to you. <laughs> Ali, what, what advice would you give to our audience? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, Gali kind of stole my thunder, like use the network. I mean, NYU, I mean, yes, it's called New York University, is a global institution. I mean, I don't remember the, what are the 18 different schools around the globe or something like that? I mean, there's campuses everywhere. And so it's not, you know, if you are based in New York, fantastic. If you're not, fantastic. There's, you know, a network and a set of people that you can go learn from, you can go ask questions of and you know, I think it, it took me like when I first started my career, I was very much like, OK, I'm an engineer, I'm a tech person. Like you kind of go into your little hole and it can be really easy to do that, especially earlier in your career. And like if anything, I wish I had picked my head up sooner to go, wow, you know, at the end of the day, you, you learn so much from others, not just, you know, reading the Internet or I guess now nowadays students would just be interacting with chat GPT. Um, and so like leverage that network, leverage the, the professors, all of the faculty, everyone at NYU. I mean, NYU do is, is doing leading research in all of you know, the world of finance. So I just think leveraging that and don't be scared to leverage that. Like it can be very intimidating to be like, oh, I'd really like to talk to this person or learn from this person. Like, don't, you know, take a deep breath, write the email, reach out. Larry, are there things, uh, last word, that you'd like Absolutely. to see researchers here focus on? Well, look, I think uh, 20 years ago, maybe payments weren't sexy. I think payments is very sexy right now. I think you'll get great jobs in payments. Uh, all of us are hiring. Uh, and I think that as long as you continue to add to your understanding of payments uh, along the journey, I think that's, a, you know, go on a journey, keep learning, keep learning new pieces of the infrastructure, new pieces of the analytics world, um, try and get an internship always. I think a lot of companies would, would love, we, we love bringing folks in from, from university training up and then they go into different parts of the organization. Uh, and I think a lot of tools can be applied to, to payments. So you might come from the analytics space. Uh, the Stripe founder started in college, right? And so there's a lot of great uh, snippets of code that you can get in and start coding new, new experiences yourself. I think learn through doing. I think we sort of someone's touched on that earlier, right? You can do research and research, but until you talk to someone, bring it into practice, you really aren't going to ultimately live and live and breathe it. Uh, but I think it's going to be a very fascinating next ten years in the in the world of payments. And we love payments because it's the access point to the relationship between us and the customer. And I think if you can live at live at that moment, you know, you are customer first, and you'll go many places. Thank you guys so much. This is an amazing panel. Thanks for your contributions to NYU and obviously your success in the payments universe and for shedding light on the technological changes at the front end and the experience for the user and how we might uh, see that reshaped by AI and also just the changes around the world in the banking structure and what that means for, for data and for understanding and for frictionless payments in the future. So this has been a great panel. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you all so much.